Well, good morning. I want to welcome you again to Cross Community Church. We really are glad that you're here. Uh, I want to let you know on the front end, uh, our work here, the thing that we focus on as a church, me and the elders and, and our staff, uh, we are all uh, giving ourselves to the mission of this church, which is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and that's our hope for you, that uh, each and every day as you walk with Jesus, that you'll be conformed to his image, that you'll walk in obedience to everything he commands, that you might find the abundant life that's available to you. Uh, every day, growing to uh, understand and recognize the love of God for you more, that you might in turn begin to love him more. And as we grow to love God more, we obey his commands more. And so we love our neighbor and our enemy, and we live out the good things that God has given us in in this life. And to be honest with you, it's my hope that our church, that Cross Community Church, that you uh, would be the church of Jesus Christ in our community and that light would begin to shine in the darkness and that the world could look, like the world, wherever they are, they could look and see that the people of Jesus Christ have an unusual hope, an unusual joy, an unusual love one for another, that the light would begin to shine in the darkness. Now, uh, our, our plan for helping to lead people to become fully devoted disciples is, is, is a little six steps, six practices of a disciple that we say, if you're going to be a part of this church, we're going to ask you to strive for these things. Now, we know people are going to struggle. You're going to fall down at times, but strive for these six things. The first is devote, devoting yourselves daily to Jesus Christ, that you would spend time with Christ in his word, like looking into the scriptures that you might know the truth and you might walk in that truth. We ask that you would uh, commune with God in prayer throughout whatever's going on in your day, that you just walk with God in prayer throughout your day. So that's devoting daily. The second thing, that you would gather here consistently. We know the world can be a difficult place, and so we gather here weekly with the body of Christ to be encouraged, to build one another up, to hear the word of God, to, to sing together, to be encouraged by one another. The third thing we ask you to do is to commit yourself to community. That means that you walk through life with a group of believers who are in your corner no matter what. That means through uh, the times where maybe uh, uh, things are difficult, they're going to encourage you. When life's going well and maybe you're tempted to go off the rails, they're going to encourage you to come back to the faith. They're going to speak into your life, help you, to help you to know God's truth. We ask everyone here to use the gift that God has given you. If you're a believer in Christ, you've been given a spiritual gift that's for the building up of this body. Like this body isn't complete without you using your gift for us. We ask everyone to give sacrificially to the work of the kingdom through this church that you would say, uh, it's not all about me. We're going to kind of pool our, our resources, and we're going to be light in the darkness together. We're going to reach out and minister uh, both here and abroad. And the final thing that we ask our members to do, to strive for together, is that you would engage missionally, that your life wouldn't be lived with you as the end, but instead that you would go out and you would say, you know what, Jesus Christ is the end. Jesus Christ is the hope. And we would articulate the gospel to people who really need to hear it. Now, I don't know how you feel about that plan. Um, that's our strategy as a church, just point people back to the things that the early church did. Like the, the newest believers, the first believers after Jesus rose from the dead, Peter preaches on Pentecost, they just got busy about those six things, and they changed the world. Through those six things, they just sought after God. And men and women who didn't have a history in the Word, they weren't raised in Sunday school, they didn't have godly parents necessarily, God used them to change the world, not because they were remarkably gifted or talented or overwhelmingly charismatic, but because they just gave themselves to six simple things that were really pursuing God and faithfulness to what he would lead them to do. And so that's our hope. Now, as much as I like our, our strategy, as much as I like that biblical plan of just seeking God and saying, God, do it in us because we can't do it in ourselves, I'm going to be honest with you, um, it's not perfect. As a matter of fact, if you've been in this church for very long and even stri been striving for those six things yourself, you know that it doesn't always go well. We've been in this series the last uh, few weeks called The Snake in the Garden where we are paying attention to the work of the enemy in our lives. As much as we might want to push back the darkness, as much as we, we might want to seek after Jesus and live our lives in full devotion to him, we would be fools if we ignored the fact that as much as we want to do those things, the enemy would want to stop us. The enemy would want to keep us from knowing God and loving our neighbor and serving one another and giving to those who are in need. The enemy would wish to stop that. Jesus said, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have 
life. And so we've been looking at the work of the enemy. Last week we saw that the enemy works to deceive us. We saw it in Genesis chapter 3. Leads us to question God's word. Did God really say that? And then leads us to question, like, how destructive is sin? Like, surely it won't be that bad. Surely it won't die, right? And there in the garden, the serpent, our enemy, deceived Adam and Eve. They took of the one thing that God withheld from them, which was really the knowledge of evil. And he used it to wreak havoc on all of God's creation. Now, today, we want to look at the second tactic of our enemy. He's not just a deceiver. He's also an accuser. And so I want to lay some groundwork as we get started today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at this one more time. We're going to begin today in verse 6. The serpent has deceived Eve. She's bought. She thinks, man, if I eat of this, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to know good and evil. It's going to enrich me. It's a delight to my eyes. It's going to be good for food. She's going to eat of this forbidden fruit. Verse 6 says, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, a delight to the eye, the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Here, here's what I want you to know. You and I, this is true of Adam and Eve. We were created by God. Now, you probably believe that. We were created for God, and we were created for His glory. You and I were made to live in a relationship with God uh, that looks like what Adam and Eve had with God prior to their sin. They walked with God. They talked with God. They existed in the garden with Him. He had spoken to them of their identity, of their worth. He creates Adam and Eve in the image of God. Now, just to be really clear, uh, male and female were not the same. In, in the garden, right? But both were created in the image of God. They didn't fully, either one of them, have all the attributes of God in and of themselves, but rather they were created in the image of God to reflect His glory. And so Adam and Eve, you go back to chapter 2, verse 25, um, they were, the two were made to come together in one flesh. They were married. Adam said of her, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is my wife. And they were naked and they had no shame. They walked with God in this perfect relationship. They could look to their creator and know that he was perfect and he was perfectly good. And they could know that God said about Adam and Eve that they were very good. Even though there were some distinctions between them, they were very good, created in the image of God. So they walked with God and they walked with one another with no shame. But then sin enters the world. In verse 7, it says that the, then the eyes of both of them were opened when they ate of the fruit. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loin coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. Now Adam and Eve who have walked every day of their existence in the garden with God who had been walking, living together, naked and unashamed. They'd never known shame. They'd never known fear. They'd never known insecurity. They had existed in this perfect relationship with God. Upon sinning, they begin to no longer be unashamed, but they begin to walk in shame. And in that shame, they recognize Adam's like, hey, Eve and I, we've got some different things going on here. There are distinctions, and so they immediately want to hide themselves, their uniquenesses from one another. And, and, and their first instinct is to hide themselves from God. Now, just to be clear, God's always been good. He created them in his image. He loved them. Like they were for God, and God was for them. He spoke to them of who they were, that they were very good, that they were male and female. They were distinct and yet good in his image. And then sin enters. And their first inclination upon feeling the shame, the guilt of sin, is to hide from one another and from God. They feel the weight of sin. Their eyes are open. They've sinned against God, and sin separates us from God. God is perfectly holy, and Adam and Eve, who are sinful, 
Like they can't come together anymore. They can't have that fellowship they once had. Scripture tells us they spiritually died uh, when they took of the fruit and they entered into sin. Just as light can't have fellowship with darkness, man could no longer live in that perfect relationship with God anymore. They were separated due to sin. So they begin to hide. The enemy had deceived them, but he wasn't done. He didn't stop there. And he continued his work in the world. And if you read throughout Genesis, man, it's, it goes bad so quickly. We see that Adam and Eve would have been parents who watched as one of their sons murdered the other because he was jealous that his brother had offered a better sacrifice. You read through Genesis and where Adam once said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh of Eve, that he loved her saw her as an equal created in the image of God, you see women very quickly subjugated, abused, made to be servants, treated as property. Deception enters in. Men begin to live for themselves. They no longer knew who they were because they were separated from God. They no longer had this perfect communion with their creator where you could say, hey, you're created in my image like you were created by me and for me and for my glory. And so man was kind of left to fill in the gaps. Like, who am I? What am I supposed to be here for? And Satan, the accuser, was ready to come in. He was ready to convince them that their lives were ultimately about themselves. And so men and women began to live very selfishly, caring about themselves and not other people. The world, all of creation, broken by sin. And so if I can deceive my brother to advance my own interest, deceit it is. Person went against person. Nation rose up against nation. Dominated by fear, by shame, insecurity, envy, lust. Every sin running rampant in creation. And man could do nothing about it. We were hopeless. The world was broken. The world was dark. But God, in his great love for us, even though we'd sinned against him, even though his creation had rebelled against him, a creation that was perfect, that was very good, a creation by him, for him, and for his glory that had now rebelled against him, God loved us enough to send his son Jesus. Jesus entered into this broken creation. He felt the rejection that you and I felt. He felt the pain. He felt betrayal. He felt the gossip, the words of gossip, the sting of that in his life. He felt betrayal among his friends. He felt the things that we felt. He felt the brokenness of creation. And yet Jesus lived on this earth a perfect life. He was without sin. And he went to the cross to make an atoning sacrifice for us. We were separated from God and left to our own devices, trying to answer the questions of who am I, what am I for, like who should I live for, what's my life supposed to be about, like why am I on this earth, like what are, we did a really terrible job of answering those questions. But God sends his son Jesus to the cross that we might be reunited with God, that the dividing wall of hostility, the thing that separated us from God, that wall of sin might be torn down and that you and I could again live in this relationship with God where we could look to our creator to know what our purpose is, that we could look to our creator to know our worth and our value, that we could again begin, uh, begin to relate rightly with all of creation, with one another and with God. God wants to restore that which was broken by sin, that which was broken by our enemy. He wants to restore that. He wants to heal that. God wants his people to manifest his kingdom once again here on this earth. You and I ought to experience something profoundly different than the rest of the world because we've once, once again been brought into a relationship with our creator. Jesus, there on the cross, he hung there having been beaten, 
nails driven through his wrists and his ankles. Listen, the physical pain wasn't the biggest event of that day. God took all of our sin, that dividing wall, he placed it on Jesus. And he took the righteous, perfect life of Jesus and he credited that to our account, to those of us who would come to faith in Christ and stop trusting in ourselves, but instead trust in him. So once again, we have this opportunity to commune with God, to know him, to walk with him as Adam and Eve knew him and walked with him. To know our worth, to know our purpose, to understand who we are in Christ. And man, wouldn't it be amazing if every believer, we recognized that we were all created by God and for God and for his glory, that this life wasn't ultimately about us, it's ultimately about God, that you were created uh, in the image of God, like he didn't make mistakes when he created you, that he created you very good, even in his sights, those things that you fear, just as Adam and Eve, they, their eyes were open, they saw their differences and thought, and I'm not like him, I'm not like her, and they began to hide from one another. What if we saw our differences as the work of a perfect creator? What if we saw that we were created in his image and ultimately to bring about glory for him in our lives? We're not created for us, we were created for him. To make much of God while we live here on this earth. We began to live like that. And the light began to shine in the darkness. And we began to share the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. We began to manifest his goodness to this world. And men and women would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Wouldn't that be amazing? If it just caught fire, right, and just spread across the world and people could know Jesus and be reconciled to him once again. Like Jesus came to undo the brokenness, the destruction of sin. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could see that manifested in our lifetime? And yet once again, I want to remind you that we have an enemy who is opposed to that. And one of the primary ways he works in the life of a believer is through accusation. He doesn't want you to look to Christ for your identity. He doesn't want you to look for, to Christ to know who you belong to or what your purpose is here on this earth. He wants you to look at yourself. When you ask the question, um, who am I? Who am I on this earth? Like, what am I here for? We start thinking about identity and purpose. The enemy would wish to just step in to that gap and start giving you some answers. He would want to accuse you rather than seeing yourself as the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you've come to faith in him, a child who's been fully reconciled, that your sin has been taken away and new life has come, the enemy would wish to step into that gap and begin to whisper things to you. You've probably experienced this most of your life. Who am I? And the enemy would say, you're your sin. Remember that thing you did? Aren't you ashamed? How could you act like that? You know your weakness? You know your failures? You know that thing that person said about you? That's true. You are not created by a good God in his image, by him and for him and for his glory. You're something far less. You're broken. You're scarred. You're empty. You're hopeless. And he begins to whisper lie after lie, lobbying accusation after accusation at us. When I was a kid, uh, some things happened in my life at a young age. And I, I didn't understand it all fully at the moment, uh, what was happening to me sexually. I didn't, I didn't get it. I was too young for that. Uh, but what I understood innately was that it was wrong. From the time I was a young boy, the enemy would whisper, there's something wrong with you. You're broken. You're bad. That's who you are. As I got older, it continued. And you get older, you start to understand the world a bit better. You understand what's going on. 
And along the way, the enemy was constantly there accusing and working and, and trying to undermine what God ultimately wanted to do in my life. And so this idea that I, somehow I was bad or I was broken, I carried that with me. It became my identity. I wore it like a label. And I worked really hard um, against that. Now, there were times where I just kind of adopted it, right? I'm bad. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to be the bad kid. And if you were my teacher in school, you might know that I, I lived up to that in, in some way. So here's my apology for that. And yet, as I got older and God began to work in my heart, I, I didn't want to be bad anymore. I wanted to honor God. And so I worked really, really hard to be good. And yet, even trying to be really good on my own, I was quite a failure there too. I don't know what your story is, but I'm guessing if you were to look back over the course of your life, you know the accusation of the enemy. Maybe for you, it's kind of like what happened with Adam and Eve. They, their eyes were open. They recognized they were naked. They felt like they needed to hide and cover themselves. Maybe for you, it has to do with your gifts and your abilities. You're questioning the goodness of God's creation in you. And you look at other people and you think, you know what, I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not charismatic enough. I don't have the personality they have. I'm not smart enough. I don't, I'm not able to process and understand. I'm not articulate enough. And the enemy's like, no, you're not. I don't live that life that Christ has for you. I want you to live this miserable life, believing things about yourself that aren't true. Or maybe for you, it, it was sin, kind of like it was in my case. And the enemy, every time you're ready to live for the Lord or begin to pursue after him, he's like, hey, don't chase after God. You need to hide. I mean, just cover yourself up. Hide from God because you're dirty. You're broken. You're scarred. You're sinful. Do you remember your shame? Do you remember your guilt? Do you remember what you did when no one was looking? Do you remember how you hurt him? You hurt her? Do you remember how you disappointed your dad? Remember how you hurt your mom with your words? Hey, don't seek after God. Don't you dare attempt to live this abundant life. Why don't you just hide? Why don't you just live in fear? What the enemy wants to do, he wants to keep us from living that abundant life. Jesus Christ has died on the cross. He's purchased new life for us that we can live in joy and abundance and victory. But the enemy is still at work to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus Christ says you can. The enemy often says you can't. And he lies to us about even seeking after God, about pursuing after other people. He lies to us about fulfilling the purpose for which we were created. One of the lies that's often told in the church today is that you can't. You because of your sin, maybe, because of your brokenness, because you're not smart enough, maybe God didn't do a good job of creating you. The enemy would whisper in your ear, you can't read the word. You're not one of those reader kind of people. You can't understand. Maybe the Bible's not for you. Why don't you just hide? Why don't you go hide in a hobby? Why don't you just go make your life about you? You can't read. You can't study the word. You can't understand it. You were created by God. And for God and for his glory, you were made to know God. You can read the word. Another lie the enemy tells, I hear it all the time. You can't pray. How can you pray to God? You're not very good with your words. and Not sure you could talk to God and maybe God wouldn't want to hear you even if you did. You remember the things you did? Ah, don't come before God. Don't you pray. And yet we're reminded you were created by God and for God and for his glory. That God made you for a relationship with him. And if we're really honest, we're pretty good at talking. And that's what prayer is. Is us communicating with God. And we get to know him. And he, gets to know, he, he knows us. And we interact with him in this relationship. You can pray. As well as anyone in all of God's creation. You can pray. You can commune with God. He tells you lies like you can't share the gospel. Y'all, we know this isn't true. Like we're pretty good. Yep. Anyone have a favorite restaurant or you eat a new place? 
and you can't wait to tell your friends about it. Like you're like, let me just tell you about this steak that I ate. It was amazing, and they had all the the extras. And we just brag on things that are enriching to our life. And yet, when it comes to this idea of the one who set our souls free from death, the enemy is there. Like, oh no, 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 you can't share. Not you. He whispers these lies of accusation. How could you share the gospel? Remember the things you've done? Remember your weakness? Remember your brokenness? Not you. You can't. And when we believe these lies of the enemy, the church is weak. We aren't built up in the faith. We're not light in the midst of darkness. When the world doesn't experience the benefits of Christ. There's a a passage in Zechariah chapter 3. You probably don't look there very often. I want to read it to you. This is where Satan is doing his work of accusation. Zechariah has seen a series of visions here. And God gives him this vision. He's standing before the angel of God. And he sees in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, he sees this picture. It says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. And so here's Joshua, the high priest, and he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan is standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, Joshua was indeed a priest. And if you know much about high priests, you couldn't just come into the presence of God, right? Like the priests would have to consecrate themselves. There were special clothes they had to wear. There was ceremonial washing. They would have to come into the presence of God with blood. But it was their job to minister before the Lord. That was his job. And yet there's a problem with Joshua in this scenario. Look in verse 3. It says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Joshua, the high priest, who had been created to minister before the Lord on behalf of the other people, Joshua is a high priest and he's in filthy garments. He can't come before the presence of the Lord. And there, in verse 1, Satan is standing at his right hand to accuse him. Just lobbying all the things, all the insults, all the reminders about his sin. Look at you, you're filthy. You're broken. You're hopeless. You can never be made clean. In verse 2, the Lord says to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. God said, hey, Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, they're my people. They belong to me. I've chosen him. The Lord rebuke you. And he uses this phrase, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? It's maybe better translated, is this not like a stick brought out of the fire? And what what this gives us is a portrait of salvation. If you remember us in our sin, like our destination is a place called hell. What we deserve is the fiery wrath of God. And yet what God is saying to Satan and in front of Joshua is, hey, here's my chosen person. I've saved him. He was destined for destruction, but I went and got him. I plucked him out of the fire. And he goes on, and he he says to him in verse 4, He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, and he said, Remove the filthy garments from him. Take off those filthy garments. As the enemy would stand there accusing and saying, You're not worthy to come before God. You're not worthy to be used of God says, hey, I chose him. I chose her. I saved him out of the fire. Now take those filthy garments off. And again he said to him in verse 4, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Now it's not a word we use very often in our vocabulary, but if you were a good Jew, you probably would have understood that this, these robes were robes of consecration. They were robes of rejoicing. They were robes of purity. They were robes that you used to celebrate. Take off that iniquity, that impurity. Clothe him with joy. Clothe him with consecration. 
in a sense, it's put your priestly robes on. Get back to ministering before the Lord. Get back to representing God to the people. To ministering between them. That you might see that you have a, a role and assignment. That God has chosen you. That God has called you. That God has saved you. That he's made you for his very own. So the accusation that was happening there is Satan stood accusing Joshua the high priest. You know who intervened? It was God. He stepped between the two of them and he reminded them of who they are, of who he was, and of what God had ultimately called him to do. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, the apostle Peter, who had a little bit of a checkered past, the apostle Peter, who was one of the 12 apostles, right, walked with Jesus, he saw the miracles. The apostle Peter who was one of the inner three, who swore he would never deny Jesus, but when accused by a slave girl, denied even having any idea who he was. He'd sinned. He'd blown it. He'd been called of God and shirked his responsibility. He'd fallen into sin. And that same apostle Peter, upon receiving the Holy Spirit of God, he writes these words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and he's talking about himself. He's talking about the believers of his day, and he was talking about you. He says, but you, just put your name in the blank there. Hey, Jason, you're not bad. You're not broken. You're not hopeless. You're not unwanted. Jason, let me tell you who you are. You are chosen. You're a chosen people. A royal priesthood. This is the people of God. This is you. You are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Like what God wants us to do is to begin to live this life no longer in the darkness. No longer in light of the fall and of our sin and who we once were. No longer in light of our weaknesses. No longer in light of our, our past failures. But instead we walk in the light that we would recognize that who God has made us to be. We are a chosen people that God chose you. You, with maybe your lack of intelligence or charisma or whatever other excuse or lie you've been believing. You, with your sin and the thing that you did last week that you're super ashamed of. You, who might have been a disappointment to your parents or whatever it might be in your life. God chose you. And he made you his priest. He made you to live in a relationship with him. Where you minister before the Lord and you minister to men. You are a priest before God. He's clothed you in those robes. He's consecrated you as his own. You are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. And he did this. So that you might live a life for his glory. He snatched you out of the fire. And he saved you. He's made you holy and he's made you righteous so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness and into his light. So we as the people of God, we get to walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, we proclaim the excellencies of God. We talk about what God has done for us. We talk about who God is. We tell those who have bought the lie of Satan that they're worthless, that they're unwanted, that no one uh, likes them, that they don't have enough talent, they're not good enough, they're too sinful, they've done too many things. We as the people of God, we, bestay, we stand between those men and God and we say, listen, let me tell you what God has done for me. And let me tell you about the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, that he died on the cross, that you might be reconciled to him, that you can leave this darkness and begin to walk in light. And yet for us, if we're going to minister in that way, 
We've got to step out from under accusation. We've got to quit believing the lies of the enemy against us. We've got to be renewed to who we are in Christ Jesus. And y'all, you need to know that this isn't a battle where the enemy is going to go down easily. He's not just going to give up on you. As a matter of fact, when we look at this in Revelation chapter 12, to talk about the enemy as our accuser, that's where he's known or labeled as the accuser of the brethren. It says that he is our accuser of the brethren who accuses them day and night. Y'all, he's not going to give up. And so we have to continually be renewing our minds. That's why we devote daily. That's why we gather here consistently. That's why we walk in community. That's why we serve one another faithfully. And we give sacrificially. And we engage missionally. Because we as the people of God, chosen people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, whose lives, the reason you were created, to know God, to walk with him, and to bring him glory in this life, so we embrace that, and we walk in that, and we live that out, the hope of the world and ourselves. So here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to have a time of invitation. And today, I, I, want, I want you to change some clothes, if you will. I don't know what you've been believing. What accusation the enemy would lob against you that he would want to just keep beating you up with day and night. The thing that he says that you're not, that you really are in Christ. The thing that he says that you are when you're no longer in Christ, whatever it may be in your life, that you would spend these next few minutes and you would just hear those words of God over you, like take off those filthy clothes. Put on a robe of righteousness. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we pray, God, that we would begin to see ourselves not in light of how we relate to the rest of creation, not in light of our past or our failures or our sin, but God, we could see ourselves as Adam and Eve saw themselves before sin entered in, created by you and for you and for your glory. God, that we might commune with you, abide in you and you in us, that our lives might bear much fruit. God, I want to pray this morning against any lie or accusation of the enemy. But God, in these next few moments, would you just give us the grace to accept and to walk in and embrace the truth about who we are because of the work of Jesus Christ for us. And God, may we be a people who declare the excellencies of you, who has called us out of darkness and into light. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.